Marsha McLuhan's Global Village has become a reality largely due to the capacity of our worldwide satellite network to almost instantaneously relay live news, sports, and entertainment programming to hundreds of millions or even billions of people worldwide. Satellites are powerful tools for shaping our collective future. Since our world, the first global satellite TV broadcast that occurred on June 25, 1967, satellites have periodically united the planet by relaying watershed events of major importance to billions of people. Because of this revolutionary technology, the world has become a single global family. The hundreds of telecommunication satellites in orbit above the Earth's equator collectively generate an invisible electromagnetic web that continuously bonds our world together in real time. But just what is an orbit, anyway? They can be circular, or they can travel in an ellipse. Elliptical orbits have a point where the ellipse comes closest to the Earth's surface, and this is called the perigee. At the furthest end of an ellipse, that point is called the apogee. Elliptical orbits are used to transfer satellites from their launch orbit into a stationary orbit above the Earth's equator. Now, our orbits can be equatorial or in the plane of the equator. They can be polar in the plane of the Earth's polar axis or inclined in degrees. Mathematician and science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke first proposed the use of satellites for the broadcasting of radio and TV services in a pioneering article published in October of 1945. A central part of his proposal was the use of a unique band of outer space real estate located some 22,300 miles above the equator. A body in such an orbit, he wrote, would revolve with the Earth and thus would be stationary above the same spot on the planet. It would remain fixed in the sky of a whole hemisphere. From a geostationary orbit, one satellite can blanket up to 42% of the Earth's surface. Now, every satellite has an assigned orbital position. And this assigned position is located at a point over the Earth's equator, called the sub-satellite point. Now, the Earth has been divided into 360 degrees. Meridians, imaginary lines circling the globe from pole to pole, cross over each of the equator's 360 degrees. The distance from one meridian to any other is defined in degrees of longitude. The prime meridian, which crosses through London, England, is referred to as zero degrees, while the two 180-degree segments to either side of the prime meridian are assigned ascending values of east and west longitude. East and west meet again at the International Dateline which runs through the Pacific Ocean area. The International Telecommunication Union is the principal agency of the United Nations concerned with international civil communications. International cooperation is essential if we are to have efficient and equitable use of the Clark orbit which is, in fact, a limited planetary resource. This explains why the ITU has been charged with the assignment of satellite frequencies and orbital locations on a global basis. All satellites are assigned one or more sets of frequencies for interacting with a network of Earth stations. A frequency can be defined as the number of times that an alternating current passes through one complete cycle in one second of time. 
One cycle per second is also called one hertz, named after the 19th century radio pioneer Heinrich Hertz. 1,000 cycles per second is abbreviated 1 kilohertz, 1 million a megahertz, and 1 billion a gigahertz. Each frequency has a specific wavelength, which is the actual distance that the radio wave travels during one complete cycle. With the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. The most efficient way to capture any radio signal is to use an antenna with physical dimensions that are a multiple or sub-multiple of the desired signal's wavelength. Now, wavelength is the distance that an electromagnetic wave travels during one cycle. It can be defined as a wavelength equals the speed of light, a constant, divided by the frequency. So we can determine the length of a single wave if we know its frequency. The electromagnetic spectrum is the entire continuum of frequencies used to propagate signals through space. Within this spectrum, each subset or frequency band has its own unique properties. For example, the very low frequency and low frequency bands between 3 and 300 kilohertz are primarily used for communicating with submarines and ships at sea. That's because the long wavelengths of these signals propagate very well over and even under the water surface. Local AM radio stations use the medium wave frequencies from 500 to 1600 kilohertz because the wavelengths generated within this band propagate very well along the Earth's surface over considerable distances. By contrast, international radio stations use the short wave bands between 3 and 30 megahertz. What happens with short waves is that they can actually be reflected off of the Earth's ionosphere which is an area of the atmosphere that is electronically charged by the sun's rays. In fact, it's even affected by sunspots on the surface of the sun, which cause it to be at various levels of intensity depending on solar activity. Once reflected, these shortwave signals can travel thousands of miles. The very high frequency and ultra high frequency bands, which lie between 30 and 3000 megahertz, are only affected by atmospheric conditions on a sporadic basis. For this reason, they have been assigned to local radio and TV broadcasters, as well as various two-way radio systems for short-range communications. Communication satellites are typically assigned to super high frequencies above 2500 megahertz, which are totally unaffected by high levels of sunspot activity and thus able to penetrate the Earth's ionosphere at all times. In fact, the signal wavelengths are so short at 2.5 gigahertz and above that they are called microwaves. The wavelength of a satellite signal can be measured in centimeters. To see how wavelength decreases as the frequency increases, Compare the waveguide opening for the 4 GHz feed horn on the right with the opening on the 12 GHz feed horn on the left. The frequency range from 3.2 to 4.8 GHz is also known as the C-band, while the 10.7 to 12.75 GHz frequency range is called the KU-band. Some TV satellites serving Asia and the Middle East also operate between 2.5 and 2.7 gigahertz, which is alternately known as the S-band. Moreover, satellites capable of delivering a broadband internet connection to rural dish owners now operate in the 18 to 22 gigahertz frequency range, which is also known as the KA-band. And who knows, in the years ahead, even higher frequencies may be used for satellite communications. We'll have to see just how far our technology will evolve in the next 50 years to see what will really be possible.
Today's communication satellites typically carry 10 or more wideband satellite channels called transponders. A transponder is the combination of an uplink receiver and a downlink transmitter. In video applications, the transponder acts as a repeater of one or more color TV signals. In order to understand how a transponder works, we have to first start out down on the ground. Now an uplink is used to transmit the original signal up to the satellite. After all, it's just a handler of traffic. It has to get a signal from somewhere. An uplink generates up to 2 kW of power via high-powered klystron transmitting tubes. A master earth station transmits a signal up to the satellite transponder using one set of uplink frequencies, and then the satellite retransmits the signal back to earth using a second set of downlink frequencies. The bandwidth of a satellite transponder typically ranges between 24 and 36 megahertz wide, both of which are far broader than a 6 megahertz wide terrestrial TV broadcast channel or a narrowband telephone channel. Intelsat, the world's largest satellite communications company, is a direct outgrowth of the Communications Satellite Act passed by the U.S. Congress and signed into law by President John F. Kennedy in August of 1962. Two years later, 11 nations signed the organization's inaugural charter. Then in April of 1965, Intelsat launched Early Bird, the world's first geostationary satellite. Though Early Bird's ability was limited to relaying 240 voice circuits or one analog TV channel between North America and Europe, the era of live via satellite had begun. By contrast, today's advanced Intelsat satellites are each capable of transmitting hundreds of digital TV channels, as well as tens of thousands of voice and data signals. What's more, Intelsat's globe-girdling fleet of over 50 satellites now reaches 99% of the world's populated regions through global, hemispheric, zone, and spot beam transponders, which relay services ranging from telephone, VSAT, and internet traffic to live news, sports, and entertainment. In fact, Intelsat is now the world's number one supplier of capacity for direct-to-home satellite TV broadcasts. These days, Intelsat is a private company with administrative headquarters in Washington, D.C., as well as nine uplink and downlink facilities in the USA and Germany. All of these mammoth earth stations, or teleports, interconnect with an advanced network called a GXS Media, with links to additional facilities owned by Intelsat's many customers around the world. This backbone allows Intelsat to transmit live events to billions of people simultaneously, with all aspects of its extensive network being managed around the clock at the International Video Operations Center. Domestic C-band satellites typically relay their signals to Earth between 3.7 and 4.2 gigahertz. However, international satellites more often make use of a wider swath of frequencies located between 3.4 and 4.8 gigahertz. The International Telecommunication Union has assigned this extended C-band frequency range to what it calls the Fixed Satellite Service. Moreover, the ITU has designated certain KU band frequencies for use by FSS satellites. In either case, FSS satellites are authorized to relay video, audio, 
and data signals to a fixed network of private Earth stations and not to members of the general public. To reach the general public, the ITU has also established a separate broadcast satellite service that incorporates frequencies for use by satellites authorized to broadcast their signals directly to home dishes. Attention pour décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, unité, feu. Allumage. Décollage. Les parabètes propulsifs sont normaux, le pilotage est normal. Nous avons facilités ici à Kourou. And over the border Tous les Natal. paramètres bord sont normaux et la trajectoire est normale. Practically speaking, however, home satellite TV systems are currently available for receiving TV programs from FSS as well as BSS satellites. Let's take a moment now to look at which KU band fixed satellite service frequencies the ITU has assigned for use internationally in what it calls ITU Regions 1, 2, and 3, which cover the Americas, Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, and Asia, as well as the Pacific Rim. Geostationary satellites assigned to the Broadcast Satellite Service operate in different KU band frequency segments. Today's C-band satellites typically transmit 50 watts of power per channel, while the latest KU-band satellites may transmit using 100 to 200 watts of power. Higher power on the satellites means smaller antennas down on the ground. As small as 18 inches in diameter for dishes receiving TV programs from high-power direct broadcast satellites. Though C-band satellites are perfectly capable of transmitting TV signals direct to the home, there was a very good reason why the ITU originally assigned frequencies in the 11 to 12 gigahertz range to its broadcast satellite service. In many parts of the world, C-band satellites share their frequencies with the telephone company's terrestrial microwave links. KU-band satellites, however, enjoy the almost exclusive use of their frequencies, which eliminates terrestrial interference from becoming an installation consideration. It also enables the KU-band satellite operators to transmit higher powered signals without having to worry about causing interference down on the ground. The 1983 Regional Administrative Radio Conference, or RARC, was responsible for developing the rules that govern broadcast satellite service operations within the Americas. Operating under the auspices of the ITU, RARC's decisions act as treaties among nations. Under the 1983 RARC plan, the U.S. was assigned a total of eight orbital locations for domestic DBS operations. Each of these orbital locations can accommodate 32 DBS transponders for a combined total of 256 possible DBS channels for the USA. Practically speaking, however, only three of these orbital locations can deliver DBS services to the entire continental United States, called CONUS for short. Consequently, the three prime orbital locations can accommodate just 96 DBS transponders. A fourth location can provide service into the eastern United States, but is only marginally suitable for providing service into the western U.S. 
The remaining four orbital slots can only serve locations in the western half of the country. The DBS operators transmitting services from one of the three prime orbital locations can also use one or more of the remaining orbital slots to transmit some programs regionally, to provide service into Alaska and Hawaii, or to deliver broadcast TV channels via satellite into the localities they otherwise typically serve terrestrially. The latter service is also known as local into local. The 1983 RARC plan mandates nine degrees of separation between adjacent BSS satellites. The reason? Receiving antennas smaller than 60 centimeters in diameter cannot discriminate between satellites that are closer than nine degrees apart. The wide spacing therefore prevents two BSS spacecraft transmitting on the same frequencies from causing interference to one another's TV programs. All communication satellites transmit their signals to Earth using a form of polarization. With linear polarization, signals are transmitted along horizontal or vertical planes. With circular polarization, however, signals are transmitted by means of a spiraling wavefront which rotates in either a clockwise or a counterclockwise direction. Most communication satellites maximize their use of the available frequency spectrum by overlapping their transponders, with signal polarization switching from vertical to horizontal from one transponder to the next. Or, in the case of circularly polarized signals, switching from right-hand circular to left-hand circular polarization. Transponders using one sense of polarization are totally transparent to adjacent transponders using the opposite polarization sense. Twice the amount of channels can therefore occupy the same amount of frequency spectrum. This is called frequency reuse. Turning our attention now to the satellites themselves, I'd like to talk a little bit about different types of satellites, as well as the different subsystems within each satellite which work together in order to provide the telecommunication services that we all rely upon today. The spin-stabilized satellite has a cylindrical drum which rotates on its axis, and this drum is covered with solar cells which generate electricity from the sun's rays. Energy coming into the solar cells is stored in batteries, which are then used to power the satellite. Three-axis stabilized satellites have large solar wings, with a wingspan of 80 feet or more. Now I'd like to explore the subsystems within each individual satellite. And we'll use this model in order to illustrate the different things that a satellite does. First of all, every satellite has to have a ability to communicate with the controllers themselves, receive signals from the ground, and send back data back to the ground so that we can know what's happening. After all, this satellite is 22,000 miles away, and it's rather difficult to send somebody up to repair it if something goes wrong. So we have to have some means of doing it by remote control, and this is done by telemetry signals. Now, the satellite transmits via this antenna here a continual stream of data about what's going on inside the spacecraft. This data includes information about uh, the temperature of the satellite, its orientation, uh, information about how each individual subcomponent within the satellite is functioning, so that the operating engineers can sense any problems that are developing and possibly take steps to correct for that. Also, the controlling engineers can transmit a signal up to the satellite to cause it to change its configuration. 
Now what happens in a satellite is it is sent up there with a number of extra parts or modules. This is called redundancy. And it's done so that the event that something breaks down inside the satellite, that then it can actually, by remote control, switch in a new module and be able to continue functioning. So this is of vital importance so that the controlling engineers can send signals back up to, to the spacecraft and tell it what to do. Another part of the satellite, of course, is its solar array. On the three-axis satellites, they have solar wings that are completely covered with solar cells. On the Inelsat 5 satellite, which is what this is a model of, this wingspan is over 50 feet long. Now, as a satellite orbits the globe, its orientation relative to the sun changes. Consequently, these solar wings have to be able to rotate throughout a 24-hour period so that they are continually accessing the sun. Now, the solar array charges batteries because there are periods when the Earth will go between the satellite and the sun. This is called a solar outage, a solar eclipse, if you will. Now, what we must do during that period is operate the satellite off of its battery facilities because there is no energy illuminating the panels. The batteries must provide electrical power to the satellite twice each year around the time of the equinoxes. When solar outages occur as the satellite moves into the shadow of the Earth. Three axis stabilized satellites use tiny jets called thrusters which fire hydrazine gas in order to keep all three axes of the spacecraft oriented in parallel with the Earth's polar axis. Proper orientation is also maintained by a gyroscope on board each spacecraft. The latest satellite propulsion systems are based on xenon ion technology. In this instance, the thruster pairs eject electrically charged particles at a speed of 30 kilometers per second, which is nearly 10 times the velocity of conventional hydrazine gas units. The new technology reduces the fuel weight requirements by up to 90%, giving satellite operators several attractive cost-saving options. They can launch a lighter spacecraft, install more complex, heavier communications payloads, extend the mission lifetime of the spacecraft, or any combination thereof. The three-axis stabilized satellite has sensors on board which can actually detect the presence of the Earth so that the satellite knows what direction in order to point. All geostationary satellites are assigned orbital locations over the Earth's equator. This position must be maintained to within one-tenth of a degree to the north, south, east, and west of the assigned orbital location. These little thrusters on the side provide the ability to move the satellite within a 70-mile box up in the sky, which the satellite is allowed to meander in. Uh, it can move up to 70 miles without being detected down on the Earth by smaller receiving antennas, because at that distance, that's a relatively small shift. And of course, a satellite can also be moved from one location to another if necessary. And this is typically done by Inelsat in order to maneuver the satellite wherever it's most needed, no matter what location. Uplinks come in two basic configurations. One is a permanent facility that is mounted onto the ground and serves as a gateway station for regularly communicating with one or more satellites in geostationary orbit. Fixed uplinks are often used to distribute live 
or tape events to millions of satellite receive sites via domestic or international spacecraft. These facilities at Intelsat, for example, contain the technical expertise and resources needed to support full bandwidth audio and video for viewing virtually any place in the world. The other type of satellite uplink now in use worldwide is the mobile teleport, which can transmit from almost any conceivable location reached by road. Live sporting events, for example, can be broadcast live right from the site of the event itself. Finally, breaking his silence. Today's mobile teleports operate almost exclusively in the KU band frequency range. Since these transportable terminals do not share their frequencies with terrestrial microwave systems, they can arrive on the scene without having to worry about causing interference to other communication networks down on the ground. News organizations can therefore move a satellite news gathering vehicle, or SNG, quickly from site to site to uplink news stories as they happen. Some KU band uplinks can even function as miniature TV studios. This particular Unisat vehicle, which contains rack-mounted recording, playback, and monitoring facilities, can put a signal onto any given satellite within 15 minutes of arriving on the scene. Motorized jacks to the front and rear of the chassis are used to stabilize the body of the vehicle to ensure antenna pointing accuracy over time. This motorized antenna can travel more than 180 degrees in azimuth and 90 degrees in elevation. Moreover, the satellite downlink section of the van provides technicians in the field with the ability to monitor the quality of their own transmissions as well as receive signals originating from other locations. The motorized antenna is adjusted to the proper coordinates while the technician looks for an indication that the antenna is bore sighted onto the correct satellite. Qualitative measurements are then made through the use of a rack mounted spectrum analyzer. Now microwaves exhibit many of the characteristics of light. Like light, they travel in a straight path along the line of sight. From the satellite to the Earth, they travel a distance of 22,300 miles, roughly. Over the course of that journey, the wave front from the satellite is being spread out over an ever-widening area. Spreading that signal over such a wide area is kind of like trying to take a, a can of paint and paint all of New York City with it. The signal becomes thinner and thinner as it's spread over an ever-widening area or surface. In order to take full advantage of the limited amount of power available, the satellite's onboard antennas concentrate the signals into a tight beam that is concentrated over the intended coverage area. Each satellite has its own characteristic coverage beam. And the way that it's transmitted down onto the ground has its own unique shape. This shape is also called a footprint. Each communication satellite generates one or more characteristic footprint patterns, with the signal strongest toward the center, then gradually diminishing in strength until reaching the edge of coverage. Domestic satellites typically generate just one or two downlink footprints per frequency band in use, and with the pattern centered over the operator's home country. International satellites, however, are often designed to achieve spatial isolation between two or more regional coverage beams, which allows the same frequency spectrum and sense of polarization to be reused two or more times on the same satellite platform. Footprint maps from the satellite operator 
provide a good starting point for determining the approximate strength of the satellite signal at your location. But it is always a good idea to double check the footprint data with the most up-to-date information available for your area. Even so, these satellite footprint maps supply us with a good idea of the intended coverage area and is a, are a starting point in the design of any satellite earth station. Once you have determined the strength of the satellite signal at the site location, you can design a receiving system for delivering high quality pictures and sound. Charts, computer programs, and other resources are available that will allow you to determine the right combination of Earth Station components for receiving a good signal from any given satellite. In addition, some satellite operators offer footprint maps that already list the recommended dish sizes for different areas within the satellite's coverage beams. Satellite antennas are passive reflectors which use a parabolic curve to reflect the signals to a common point. Here, the feed horn captures these signals and funnels them onto the first stage of electronic amplification, the Low Noise Block Down Converter, or LNB. These days, however, most satellite systems are equipped with a single device that combines the feed horn and LNB into a streamlined package called the Low Noise Feed. On larger dish systems, the feed horn component of the LNF will incorporate a scalar plate that consists of a series of concentric rings for capturing as much of the incoming signal as possible. The purpose of the rings is to help direct the signal into the waveguide that connects the feed to the LNB. By contrast, tiny DBS dishes often use a feed horn design that on the outside appears to be little more than a funnel. Like its large dish counterpart, this feed horn funnels the signal contribution of the dish onto the receiving system's first stage of electronic amplification. Larger dishes may also be equipped with an actuator motor that will require a separate control cable. Since each satellite has its own unique position in the sky relative to this location, the antenna must move from satellite to satellite to receive all the available programming. That requires the use of a motorized antenna mount. For the larger C-band dishes, the polarizing component of the LNF may include a small servo motor, which physically rotates a single element or probe to match the system to the polarization of the incoming satellite signal. Alternatively, the polarizing component may consist of a ferromagnetic element that has been inserted into the waveguide. In either case, the polarization of the LNF changes in response to a control voltage sent by the indoor receiver. Adapters are also necessary in order to convert feeds from linear polarization to circular polarization. This is done by using a simple dielectric insert available from some vendors, which slips inside the throat of the feed horn and seats at a 45 degree angle relative to the probe. By rotating the probe to either side of the dielectric, we can receive both senses of polarity. Low noise feeds are also available that integrate the feed horn component with two or more separate LNBs. This allows the outdoor unit to receive all the available signals from a single orbital location at one and the same time without requiring the receiver to switch polarizations. The use of a large C-band dish offers other advantages. For example, C-band frequencies are not affected by rain fades signal attenuation problems caused by torrential downpours. Atmospheric particulates can actually interfere with the signal, depolarizing the downcoming signals from KU band satellites and also raising the noise temperature of the sky. Due to the short wavelengths involved, 
Raindrops can scatter or even absorb KUBN satellite signals as they pass through the Earth's atmosphere. The same also applies to the KA band signals now being transmitted by broadband satellites operating in the 18 to 22 gigahertz frequency range. The incidence of heavy rain rates varies from region to region. With arid areas experiencing the lowest rain rate levels, and tropical regions the highest. Satellites using linear polarization are also more susceptible to rain fades than circularly polarized signals. This explains why circular is the polarization method of choice for transmitting DBS programming to tiny home dishes. Today's low-noise block down converters and low-noise feeds combine a low-noise amplifier with a wideband frequency conversion device called the block down converter. Following the feed horn is the low-noise amplifier. And this, I think, is the most important electronic circuit within the entire system. Because between it and the antenna, it determines the noise floor, if you will, for the entire system. The amount of noise created by the circuits within the LNA generate a signal that falls within the same frequency range as the satellite signals coming down from the spacecraft. Now, noisy amplifiers with a high temperature will generate more noise, and anytime you add noise to a system, you are degrading its performance. You're reducing its signal to noise ratio, and therefore it will not function as well as if there's more signal and less noise. For the best possible performance, the LNB should contribute as little noise as possible. C-band LNBs are graded according to a noise temperature, while for KU-band LNBs, this rating is expressed as an equivalent noise figure. In either case, the lower the LNB's internal noise contribution, the better its overall performance. The block down converter portion of the LNB transforms the entire satellite frequency band to a block of lower intermediate frequencies. Why? Because the cost of amplifying and processing the signal is so much cheaper at the intermediate frequency level that we can reduce the cost of the equipment down to make satellite receiving systems an affordable consumer product. This IF band contains all satellite signals of a given polarization. To minimize the cost of satellite TV receivers, the incoming microwave frequencies are converted down to a lower set of intermediate frequencies by the down converter's mixer circuit. Inside the mixer, the satellite signal is combined with a second signal generated by an oscillator. These two signals beat against each other to produce the intermediate frequency signal. This is called heterodyning. The use of a lower IF frequency band reduces the cost of all subsequent electronic components and cables. It also minimizes the amount of signal attenuation that occurs in the cable which connects the LNB to the indoor receiving unit. Most C-band LNBs employ IF blocks of 950 to 1450 megahertz. However, many KU-band LNBs use a wider IF band of 950 to 2050 megahertz, which enables a single device to receive the entire range of KU band frequencies used by satellites in many parts of the world. Receiving systems equipped with a dual LNB are able to simultaneously receive all satellite signals available from a single orbital location, regardless of polarization format. This provides each satellite receiver in the home with independent access to all of the available programming. One simple method for accomplishing this task is for the LNB to convert all satellite signals of one polarization to the 950 to 1450 megahertz frequency range and the remaining signals from the other polarization set to the 1450 to 1950 megahertz IF band. This allows all of the available programs 
to be simultaneously placed onto a single coaxial cable. Today's satellite TV receivers are comparable to personal computer systems. The wireless remote control is a kind of a keyboard and the TV screen a computer display, which presents menus that give the operator a high degree of control over the system. Surprisingly, the very complexity of these microprocessor-driven systems makes them easier to use than ever before. The factory can pre-program the receiver to remember and execute all of those little adjustments required for perfect and efficient reception. The receiver connects to the outdoor antenna in several ways. A coaxial cable connects the IF signal output of the LNB to the IF input port of the receiver. A second cable may also be needed for systems that require the receiver to have a way to electronically control the polarization setting of the feed horn. The receiver must also be connected to a TV set or monitor, either through the TV's antenna jack or by way of video and audio input cables. The motorized dish is one possible way to go when the program services are spread across multiple satellite locations in the sky. The motorized dish, however, requires the use of yet another cable. It connects the outdoor unit's antenna motor drive to the antenna controller component of the indoor receiving unit, which features the requisite electronic circuitry for storing and recalling the relative location for each and every satellite to be viewed. Another design approach is to use a single dish equipped with multiple low noise feeds, with each L and F bore sided onto a different part of the antenna reflector's parabolic curve. While this design approach allows the dish to simultaneously view multiple satellite locations in the sky, additional cables and coaxial switches will be required. The first uh, time that I saw this being done was back in 1982 when one uh, TVRO engineer built a feed system allowing four, four gigahertz feed horns and LNAs to be positioned above a 16-foot antenna. Yes, there was some loss involved, but he went to a larger antenna, the advantage being that he could actually access up to four satellites simultaneously with a single dish. That was very interesting for applications for SMA TV and cable TV users to be able to stretch their dish dollars and be able to offer many more services to their customers. And we're really seeing the same principle being applied here with a new generation of, of satellite receiving equipment. For the past 25 years, the corporate world has been deriving major benefits through their use of two-way satellite systems called Very Small Aperture Terminals, or VSATs. The technology was pioneered in the 1980s by big corporations such as Federal Express, Walmart, 7-Eleven, and AT&T to relay video, voice, and data traffic between their corporate headquarters and tens of thousands of KU band terminals in the field. Leading communications companies such as Hughes, Scientific Atlanta, and GTE SpaceNet were also enthusiastically promoting the new technology. And I'm enthusiastic about this probably more so than any other area because it has such unique uh, capabilities and advantages over all other alternatives. I think one of the most exciting ones is for retail stores to be able to have inventory control from every one of thousands of branches centralized through satellite to a hub headquarters location. Uh, one can have instantaneous knowledge of what's been sold and what remains unsold, what the pricing is, and, uh, and, and whether that uh, pricing philosophy has worked effectively or not. 
uh, automatic credit uh, card authorization, credit verification at the checkout counter can be handled over this system through a master, uh, a master system at the headquarters. Uh, one can, uh, can transfer the funds associated with that virtually instantaneously, and you don't hold up the people going through the checkout lines. Uh, th there are just so many applications that uh, benefit a retail store chain or a gasoline ch uh, chain or something like that that you can imagine that uh, from thousands of locations or even tens of thousands of locations, one needs to, uh, to send that data interactively both ways uh, back and forth between a headquarters. Other other uh, applications uh, that that are important are are the opportunity to integrate video into these systems. When you have all the small data terminals at the locations, at the branch stores, the training uh, films and uh, that you have in the past uh, transferred around by mail or had people come from the branch stores into a centralized or regionalized location for training now can be done by video broadcast. It can be done from a central location with one instructor to all those antennas instantaneously, virtually, uh, anytime you'd like. So there are many features of integrating voice and video and data along with these other uh, uh, data applications that I've, uh, that I've alluded to that make this a, uh, such an advantageous application of satellites. If you are talking about an asymmetric network where you send video, voice, and data in one direction and maybe just data and voice in the other direction, there is no other way to do that except by satellite. And that's when it really makes sense. Oh, there are other ways to do it. You could put in your own private microwave link in the United States and, and get it to every Ford dealer of America. That would cost you a fortune. But to put a small VSAT K-band antenna on top of a Ford dealer's roof and get live video and two-way interactive data, there's no other way to do it except by satellite. To transmit information, the data first must be digitally encoded as a string of binary digits or bits. Computers convert keystrokes into strings of zeros and ones, binary numbers which correspond to the off and on logic states of computer circuitry. The most commonly used format is the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, or ASCII which expresses each letter or number as an 8-bit string of binary digits. The early interfaces used to connect computers to an external communications network may look somewhat clunky by today's standards, but they were nonetheless powerful tools for interconnecting business operations. The heart of each interface is called a modem, short for modulator-demodulator. Phone line modems are generally limited to exchanging information at rates of about 100,000 bits per second. By contrast, satellite modems are able to relay data at rates of millions of bits per second. The most commonly used VSAT transmission format is called Time Division Multiplex, or TDM. It enables the entire capacity of a transponder to be allocated to a single ground terminal for a short burst of time and within a recurring time frame. Transmissions are synchronized so that no two VSATs ever occupy the same time interval. Until recently, VSAT terminals have generally operated in what is known as the star network configuration where a single hub station controls and monitors the entire system. This is especially useful whenever hundreds or thousands of locations must gain access to a common computer database. The hub station is designed to continuously monitor the network's many operations, as well as control the power levels of the uplinking earth station. The hub allocates a unique network address to each VSAT and automatically assigns the time intervals within which each ground terminal is permitted to transmit. Data requests are sent from each VSAT terminal to a satellite transponder, which functions like a bent pipe in that it is designed to turn the signal right around and retransmit it back to Earth. 
The master control station receives the signals from the satellite, accesses the requested information, and then retransmits it to each terminal in the field. Communications from one VSAT to another is also possible, with the hub acting to relay the signal from one network terminal to any other. The hub station integrates a number of high-tech components, including high-power amplifiers for transmitting signals to the satellite, uplink and downlink frequency converters, and full monitoring and control, including sophisticated antenna steering systems. Hub stations are often configured so that they can be fully controlled and monitored remotely. They also typically have emergency power backup systems so that the network can continue to operate in the event of a local power outage. While VSAT installations are similar in many ways to home satellite TV dish installations, there are some important differences. Since these systems are transceivers, capable of transmitting as well as receiving, there is a potential for creating interference to other telecommunications services. However, VSAT networks typically incorporate a failsafe. The remote terminal not only has to be pointed at the right satellite and tuned to the right satellite transponder, but also has to be authorized by the hub before it can transmit. Two decades ago, Scientific Atlanta CEO Sid Topol had this to say about VSATs. I believe that there'll be a, a satellite terminal on top of every building in the world. Uh, we got one here where I'm picking up Reuters and getting uh, stock reports. If you drive along the highways, not only do you see them in hotels and motels and apartment houses and homes, but if you look on top of business buildings, I mean insurance company buildings and bank buildings and office buildings and factories, you see an antenna now. And uh, I once said that it's going to be a, a a, a terminal in every building that has a Xerox machine or a PABX, and it's happening day after day now. Is it finally happening? Well, we're, we would like to think we're getting there. We're not there yet, but we do supply a significant number of the Fortune 1000s with VSAT technologies. Well, 20 years ago, the value driver was, as you mentioned, lower cost and, and reaching a lot of sites. In Today, we're in this new world of expanding broadband applications and both internet and intranet because corporations, of course, have requirements beyond just internet access. They, we now have all the new potential for broadband, which with today's satellites means media-rich or video content delivery to a lot of sites throughout North America on a similar single cost and single co quality of service basis. And what's important is the companies that in, in the, this realm of uh, emerging broadband don't really care about the technology. They want a certain grade of service. They want it to be fully managed. And so we're seeing opportunities, and our business is evolving as well, to follow this trend, where as a managed service provider, VSATs are very much an integral part of a combination of technologies, whether DSL, cable modem, fiber, it's not the case anymore that one technology does it all the best. Uh, VSATs are an important part, uh, but it's very much now an integral part of an IT strategy that covers multiple technologies. Uh, VSATs have come down in size and cost dramatically by 10 to 20 times, depending on what year you measure. Uh, and we're now in a, in a mode where, in fact, the fastest growing part of our Hughes business is consumer uh, satellite broadband. So uh, the cost is now below $500 for the equipment, uh, and that's a complete modem, router, and the satellite dish, which is typically less than one meter in size. And uh, the capability is every bit as good as uh, most DSL or a typical cable modem type services. Very affordable. Uh, our plans uh, start at uh, $59.95 a month, and uh, we're signing up over 10,000 a month Many of these are small businesses as well as consumers. So we, we've, we've gone from large enterprise to medium enterprise, from, from thousands of sites to hundreds of sites. 
to tens of sites to one site. So it scales very nicely because of the low cost of the terminal now. Today, a geostationary satellite, as you know, is essentially a mirror in the sky. It has transponders and communications come up to the satellite from a terminal down to a network operations center where the routing and control logic takes place and all the customer care and back-end billing systems logic. And then it goes back up to the satellite and then off to one or more terminal sites. When it comes to sending signals through HughesNet's advanced Spaceway satellite, however, all the switching and routing take place in the sky. Signals from one terminal can reach any other VSAT in the system without the need for any ground-based intervention. So it's a switch in the sky in the truest sense. Very high capacity, 10 times the capacity of a conventional KU band satellite. And uh, with obviously giving us the flexibility with this uh, new architecture to deliver mesh and other kinds of peer-to-peer -peer services. By mesh connectivity, I mean one terminal or a number of terminals can communicate with one or a number of terminals in a single hop as opposed to going up down to the network center where the logic is applied for switching back up to the satellite and then to a terminal. That's mesh network. Peer-to-peer -peer, in effect is saying that uh, a network uh, terminal anywhere in the architecture, anywhere in the continent is as important as any other and uh, they, op they communicate together at the same level of priority. The advanced switching capabilities on board Spaceway also take advantage of the new satellite spectrum in the 19 to 30 gigahertz frequency range. There's actually more bandwidth available at the KA band than the KU band. The, the higher frequencies do create some issues with managing uh, interference such as weather, uh, uh, rainstorms and uh, snow and other interference. However, we can increase the power to a particular terminal if it requires higher power to get through the interference. Fast forward through 20 years from 1987, and two-way systems very similar to those early VSATs were enabling hundreds of thousands of rural households to access high-speed internet content via satellite. These so-called personal earth stations feature a dish with a two-part feed assembly, one for handling earth-to-satellite transmissions and the other for receiving signals from outer space. The high power amplifier on the transmit side is capable of generating several watts of uplink power. Moreover, this HPA is fed by a block up converter that transforms the signals coming from the indoor unit into the microwave signals that the satellite is designed to receive. On the receive side, the feed assembly's KU band LNB down converts the satellite's microwaves into an IF signal that can be more easily delivered to PCs inside the home. The system's indoor unit serves as the interface between the satellite antenna and the home's PC. Some IDUs are even compatible with the same DOCSIS standard used by cable modems and other wired high-speed devices that connect to the internet. And that was one of the other advantages of using this off-the-shelf technology. Just like a cable modem, it's uh, Ethernet connection, so just general plug-and-play kind of situation. We're able to hook up any commercial off-the-shelf router that people buy at you know, Best Buy or, or wherever they get it, um, Linksys, etc. Um, so the good news is it is completely set up for plug-and-play connections with normal wireless and wireline peripherals. But mainly people today like to use routers, wireless routers for their house. Um, and it is completely set up to do that. One of the important things is that all the software is on our modem, so we have to think about carefully about that uh, in terms of the end-to-end -end solution, that we didn't want any software on the PC because that, that causes problems on the PC and makes it difficult to connect to other routers. Wireline broadband services such as DSL and cable are unavailable in about 15 million U.S. homes. Wild Blue is betting that many of these rural households will sign up for its satellite-based broadband service.
So we knew we had to provide a good value. And so the way to do that was to keep our costs low, to keep our prices low and keep the speeds up and uh, keep our consumers, make it attractive and keep them happy and get the good word of mouth that's really helped us out. So we did two things. First of all, we spent all the time and money to put up our own satellites that were optimized for this use. So our cost per bit in space, so the cost of the satellite capacity is much lower on a per customer basis. Uh, secondly, we used existing technology so we could just buy it off the shelf instead of trying to invent it for the modem and the dish. Uh, primarily we based it on the cable modem technology which is called DOCSIS. So we think we were smart on both the consumer equipment and up in space to try to keep our costs as low as possible. So the advantages of Wild Blue's move to KA band have so far outweighed the disadvantages. The KA band being higher frequencies allows us to have smaller spots as they hit the earth they are about 300 miles wide. The more spots you have, the more frequency reuse you can get and again, the more lower the, your cost per customer to serve from a space segment standpoint. So um, that's been a big advantage. Um, it, because it's higher frequency, there is a little bit more um, uh, susceptibility to weather events, the uh, attenuation that you get through uh, in a wireless system for rain and things like that. Um, so we had to engineer around that. The ver one of the interesting things that we have pioneered is we adjust each individual's power and modulation on a number of components to allow them to react to local weather events. So if it happens to be raining over one person's house, their individual system, our system understands that it's, that it's slowing down or having problems, it will essentially simplistically put more power to that individual or give them more access to power and, and capacity to adjust to their individual situation. So they'll never know the difference. They'll continue to have the same service. We're actually using more of our capacity to serve them at that time. KA band is just a higher frequency, gives us a little bit more bandwidth. So the real advantages with KA band spot beam is we have the ability to reuse frequency spectrum over and over and over, giving us more capacity. At the end of the day, it enables us to have lower cost services for the consumers. Our system is, is different than anybody else's out there. First in that it's KA band and it's spot beam technology. No one else offers that. Um, secondly, our dish, rather than a direct reflecting antenna where it would just simply reflect from here, back to here and out, we have a double reflecting system that simply goes to this, back here and then out. Our engineers looked at both types of systems and this is the one they finally settled on being the most efficient. We have combined both the receive LNB and the transmitter all into one piece. Oh, cool. In fact, the receive LNB, the transmitter and the feed assembly all into one, one assembly which we call the TRIA. Now there's one thing else that's really unique about Wild Blue is we use what they call a circular polarized receive and transmit feed. At the end of the day, what does that do? It makes installation much simpler. Uh, there's less adjusting that has to be done when you're setting up the antenna. Um, just less, less room for error, if you will. Wild Blue's pioneering use of the KA band frequency range offers several distinct advantages. I really think KA is just kind of the next step beyond KU, if you will. We've got a little bit more efficiency, it's got a little more capacity. We've all also went to the spot beam technology, which enables us to reuse frequency spectrum over and over and over. And by doing that, in essence, every time we reuse that frequency spectrum, we, we cut our costs in half in terms of uh, subscriber costs. Questions concerning the adverse effects of rain on KA band satellite transmissions have also been answered. Well, uh, our experience so far has been very good in terms of, uh, we've, we've experienced very little of that kind of issue uh, in terms of fading or the system dropping off. Our system is really kind of a smart system in that it can detect as signal levels start to drop and in essence shift gears. Uh, it's designed to shift gears and maybe slow down in speeds but still kind of punch through rather than going out. So, Just how much power does it take for any Wild Blue terminal on the ground to communicate with the satellite? It's actually variable. It goes up to four watts. It varies from one to four watts depending on how much is required to punch through. Let's um, and it uses what it needs when it needs it and when the weather's clear and everything's good it, it doesn't eat up as much bandwidth and power. So um, it's, it's kind of on demand if you will. Okay. 
right now video takes a lot of bandwidth when you're doing downloads, right. and it eats up a lot of a lot of bandwidth. Bandwidth usage equates to higher costs to the providers, and I can tell you we have what we call fair access policy that limits how much bandwidth you can use in a month. Now, for the average uh, consumer, 99% of the customers we have never even uh, get close to our usage limits. But for a few of those, he does. for a few of those, they download a lot of video and that kind he of thing. Of they video. could. As the opening years of the 21st century have repeatedly demonstrated, all ground-based communication systems can be devastated by both natural disasters and terrorist attacks. Satellite is the only true alternative path to any terrestrial technology. So whether the network is fiber, DSL, cable modem, landline, twisted pair, doesn't matter. It's subject to the same uh, conditions of a disaster should it strike, whether physical or natural. 9-11 was a horrific wake-up call that revealed just how ill-prepared many government agencies were when it came to dealing with the communications problems that can take place in the wake of a massive disaster. One of the biggest problems that they had is when the towers collapsed, they brought all the communications infrastructure for that area of Manhattan with them down into the hole. Nevertheless, even after 9-11, most government agencies were slow in moving to satellite-based communication systems that could prevent such confusion from ever happening again. And after 9-11, there was a lot of talk, but there wasn't a lot of action. But when Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast, it became apparent that something had to be done. For example, in the state of Louisiana, there's 40 some odd tower sites spread out across the state. Those tower sites are all interconnected by Bell South T1 lines. And this is the way a patrolman, when he hits his radio, can either make a local uh, uh, local voice communications off of one tower into a parish, or you can hit a button and do a statewide alert to all the parishes uh, by using this interconnected tower system throughout the state. And all states have something like this. But Katrina had uprooted many of the bigger trees along the Gulf Coast, and when their roots came out of the ground, they pulled out the local fiber network with them. This caused all of the tower sites to go local, and some towers even went down completely. When it came time for Louisiana to rebuild its emergency communications network, the state chose the Orbital Data Net bid. It was because we had the only completely pure satellite solution, and we really thought out of the box. Right from the start, Orbital Datanet stressed that training must be an essential component of the state's plan for rebuilding its emergency communications network. Because they might not be able to get me in a crane down there right after a hurricane. So everything that I've designed for them is done in such a way that they can repair it themselves with hand tools. For example, instead of big dishes, Orbital Datanet has installed arrays of small antennas. Even if a dish can withstand a 125 mile hour windstorm, it can't survive the Volkswagen that windstorm may throw through the antenna. So we go under the idea that our networks have to be repairable by a guy with a 3 8 inch wrench and a, maybe a battery operated satellite meter. And doing that, the state now has its own ability to heal itself. According to Hefner, there are three stages to the deployment of communication systems in the event of a disaster, with the first stage involving the use of handheld satellite phones, which typically are a good choice for the first few hours of any response effort. Doesn't take much training to flip this antenna up and then make a phone call with this unit. You have to have, be completely in a completely free sky area, have a lot of space over your head, but very, very easy to use, very inexpensive to own. Uh, the problem with them is, is that they can get oversaturated. If there's a big disaster like in Katrina, these are really only good for the first few hours of the event because there's so many of these in the field that when everybody shows up with them and turns them all on, it's a switch service network so it can easily, you can get overwhelmed. Uh, they have a limited amount of, uh, of access and a bandwidth available and once that's gone, you're going to get a busy signal. 
The second stage of deployment involves the use of a small portable terminal that is good to go for about the first day of an emergency response event. This broadband global area network unit, called a BGAN for short, is about the size of a notebook computer and operates through the worldwide Inmarsat satellite system. It is capable of providing voice and data communications well before emergency responders can hope to bring in a much larger VSAT unit. This unit is kind of a, in my way of looking at it, it's kind of a clone between a satellite radio and a VSAT. It works at the same frequencies a satellite radio does, so that means that you can simply hit a button on the unit and point it to the southern sky, wait till you get a lock signal on the indicator back here, set it down carefully on the ground, and you can plug a regular analog telephone into it, make a regular phone call, you get dial tone. Once the BGAN terminal locks onto the signal, the operator can set it down on the ground, plug a handset into the unit's standard telephone jack, or even connect a notebook PC to the terminal's Ethernet connector and log on to the Internet. With this terminal, one can sort of laptop size very quickly set up and start communicating email and voice over IP services using the BGAN. The third stage of deployment is to roll in a portable VSAT like this one, which Hefner says represents the real backbone of the response team's communication system. This mobile trailer unit has its own built-in generator, satellite modems, and even an auto acquisition antenna. However, each time Orbital Datanet sells an auto acquisition antenna, the company insists that the customer also learn how to manually adjust it, even though it will work automatically 99.5% of the time. It's that other half of 1% that gets those phone calls at 3 in the morning when you hear nothing but police sirens on the other end of the phone and the guy going, we can't get a satellite locate. Almost every time it's going to work until that one time it has to work, and that's when karma is going to come get you. But we also provide uh, what we consider very high-level training because our attitude is, is they've got to know how to use this gear, they've got to know how to repair this gear. The third level is a full VSAT. Now the VSAT itself is quite compact, but it still requires either a truck-mounted unit, something that comes in and can be set up in a matter of less than an hour or so. Or another level of that would then be a fixed VSAT with a mobile uh, power unit, maybe a generator. Uh, which we saw, for example, after Katrina in, uh, in New Orleans. This transportable VSAT terminal calculates its precise location using global positioning satellite technology and then runs the data through an automated procedure that sets the antenna's azimuth and elevation angles to the coordinates required at the site. The antenna sweeps back and forth in small increments until it locks onto the desired satellite, after which the system automatically performs all the fine-tuned adjustments required to maximize the signal reception. Um, from there, it'll lock on and it'll do its own ranging and do its own ACP test. And there you go. That's it. Done. The entire process takes about five minutes. The VSAT needs of end users can vary widely. And we'll find out pretty quickly in talking with them whether they're going to need a flatbed style mobile unit, whether they need a command center that's got sit down space in it and video conferencing like you saw in our van out there, or whether they need one of the big P25 tower trucks, which has actually got a tower built into it. This vehicle features a 500 watt generator that is linked to the van's motor. Even when the engine is running, it is capable of producing power that's smoothed by the pure sine wave inverters on board. The motorized 1.2 meter antenna with 4 watt transmitter on the roof connects to a rack of VSAT modems inside the van. And it's got video conferencing flat screens built into it, VoIP phones and just about everything that you can imagine in wanting to have in a small mobile command center. The importance is planning and then having the equipment either on standby or available to be delivered within 24 hours uh, should a disaster strike.
And we can obviously meet with the customer's requirement uh, any way uh, that they wish, either as a full backup operationally or uh, on, a, on a standby basis to be delivered when required. In August of 2007, an earthquake measuring 7.9 on the Richter scale struck Peru's coastline, cutting off all conventional communication links with the outside world. Upon hearing the news, a dedicated group of satellite-savvy volunteers from Paris-based Technicians Without Borders rushed to Peru's devastated city of Pisco from halfway around the world. Because of their efforts, emergency workers were able to ensure that desperately needed supplies were on the way. What's more, the survivors were able to contact anxious friends and relatives. This DVD has shown you how to harness the immense power that only satellites have for shaping our collective future. The rest is up to you. For Shelburne Films, this is Mark Long.